Welcome back. In this lecture, we will take a detailed look at decision trees specifically focused on how the training process works. So by the end of this lecture, you will understand how a decision tree works and how decision tree is created from data. So here is again our intuition about supervised model training. We have training data, data where we have the features, the measurements of, of what we care about, along with some ground truth information, what the answer is, what we're trying to infer. Given that training data, we will use what's called a training algorithm that we will discuss in detail today for the decision tree in order to create a supervised model. And once we have that model, we can use it to make inferences on data that has not previously been seen and draw conclusions. In this case, with our iris example, based on the measurements of petal and sepal length and width, we want to conclude what species of iris is in the picture. So you may be asking, why, why even bother to try to understand how the training algorithm works? And I think that's a very fair question because you know what? At this day and age, there are so many machine learning packages that have a great deal of maturity. You will likely never have to implement a training algorithm on your own from scratch. But I think it's important to have at least an intuition as to how these things work for several reasons. So first is model training tends to be specific for the given type of classifier. And so you'll see today, we'll talk about how model training works for a decision tree. It's totally different from how model training works for, say, a neural network. And that's even different from model training in other contexts, uh, say, for a logistic uh, regression model. And so if you can get some insight into how that works, you can understand a little bit better about, hey, is this type of classifier appropriate for what I'm trying to do. The next thing is the training algorithms often have hyperparameters of their own called algorithm hyperparameters. And so understanding how the training algorithm works uh, allows you to understand what those hyperparameters actually mean and give you kind of a clue as, hey, should I adjust this? Is it going to make a big difference or not? And finally, Every type of classifier has its advantages and disadvantages. And really, the training algorithm is where you start to get good intuitions on what that difference is. So you may look at, say, an SVM model, because that's going to separate the classes to a maximum extent, which is going to be very different from a model that uh, is going to use gradient descent like a neural network that's going to try to fit the model to the data as best it can. There are different use cases where one is better than the other. And understanding kind of what's under the hood uh, can give you those intuitions. So let's look at some key terminology about the decision tree itself that will help us understand the training process. So first is the node. So this is everything in the decision tree. These are all nodes. And it's either where a decision is instantiated or it's where a conclusion is reached. And specifying either the maximum number of nodes or the length from the top to the bottom node are common hyperparameters in many software packages for training these things. The next is the leaf node. Now the leaf node, uh, in this case it's highlighted here, this is every place where the decision tree terminates. So we see here in this first one, it's inferring that, that once it gets to that leaf node, it's inferring that the iris is in that first class, class zero. The second node is looking at the second class as the conclusion, and the third node is given uh, the third class there. Now, a child node is any node that is subordinate to one that is above it. Now, specifying the number of child nodes per parent node is also another common hyperparameter, although in practice, it usually ends up being two. Uh, 
And that's simply because if you're looking at, say, features that are real valued, it's much easier to look at, hey, is it greater than or less than? And so the two highlighted uh, nodes in the decision tree, they are the child node of the one above it, and there's two more child nodes that are seen right here. The next are thresholds. So these are values uh, assigned to a feature that cause it to make a decision. So we see that here, feature number three, if it's less than or equal to point A, and that's the threshold, then it's going to make a decision to go to one or the other nodes below it. Likewise, we have the same thing with uh, feature number two being less than or equal to 4.95. These thresholds only occur in non-leaf nodes because it's where the system is making a decision. Impurity. Now, impurity is kind of a core concept to the decision tree. This is measuring how pure of a split is being made at each iteration. And the whole goal is as you go down the decision tree, you want to, be, you want to reduce impurity. And we could see impurity here is measured with something called the Gini index that we'll describe shortly. And we start out, the value is 0.65, and at this leaf node here, it drops to zero which makes sense because when you look, this thing here that says value, this is talking about how many samples in each class meet the requirements of this leaf of the decision tree. And 37 are in the first class, and there's no samples in other two classes if you take this path in the decision tree. And so the Gini index gives you a zero, which means there is no impurity. However, you go to the other node on the other side, the Gini index drops, but only drops to 4 point, or 0.496. And we see they're still, you know, just looking empirically, these two classes are roughly balanced in terms of quantity of samples. But then we take this additional split, we see the Gini index drops again in both those leaf nodes to something much lower. So here is the Gini index. So it's a summation overall classes, so I've indexed the classes starting at number zero, ma uh, maxing out at C, and we are computing the probability a sample picked at random is in that class, and then multiplying it by uh, one minus that probability. So let's look at how uh, the values of the Gini index for our example with the IRIS data set. So here is uh, the IRIS data set, we have the feature measurements and the classes. And we can easily compute, there's 11 samples here. And for example, we have, you know, two in class zero. So probability of being in class zero is 0.18, uh, which is two over 11. And you can compute the probability of classes one and two likewise. And using the formula I showed on the previous slide, the Gini index comes out to be 0.63. So now let's split the data. We say, hey, let's say the algorithm is considering two uh, different features and thresholds. So first is, let's say, it's split, trying to split the data at a sepal width greater than 3.1. And we've divided the data. This is the same data we saw in the last slide. We're just looking at it in two different buckets. So in the first bucket, let's compute those probabilities within that particular bucket. So the probability of being in class zero is now zero. There are, there is nothing in this first uh, split of the data that is labeled with a zero. And it's split evenly between one and two. So the Gini index drops to 0.5. Um, and as this is a little more than half the data, if we weight that Gini index, um, you know, this uh, comes out to 0.27. What you see, this top half is 54% of the data, roughly. So 0.54 times 0.5 gives you 0.27. Looking at the second uh, half of the split, we have now probability of being in class 0 is now 0.4. And you have 0.2 and 0.4 for the other two classes. And this gives you a Gini index of 0.64. 
So this represents 45% of the data, so the weighted Gini index here is 0.29. So our improvement, we had originally a Gini index of 0.63 for everything, and then when we split it, we had weighted Gini indexes of 0.29 and 0.27. So when we subtract that from the original, um, original amount, you get 0 0.07. So impurity was reduced on the whole by a little bit. So it's not too bad of a split. It's making things somewhat more pure. But let's look at a different feature here. Let's look at pedal length. And let's say the algorithm picked uh, a, a length of 5.5. And it now is divided the two classes into this way. So the, uh, the top half of the data we see that the probability distribution is 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.25 for each of the three classes, respectively. And this gives us a Gini index of 0.625. It's about 3 quarters of the data, so it has a weighted Gini index of 0.45. Now let's look at the bottom half of the data, or sorry, not half, but bottom portion of the data. This is very pure, because everything in here has a label of 2. So we have 0, 0, and 1. And the Gini index has dropped all the way down to 0. This is 100% pure. And it makes sense, because they all have the same label. So weighted Gini is 0. So now when we compute this, we see a much greater improvement in uh, the Gini index. It dropped now by 0.18. So what will happen at each split of the decision tree the algorithm will look through all thresholds and all features and evaluate them, and it's going to greedily select which one gives it the greatest drop at a given node. And again, here, uh, pedal length of 5.5 uh, beats the sepal length of 3.1. Now, Gini index is just one option for computing impurity. Another option is entropy. and Essentially what happens is you treat entropy in much the same way as you would use the Gini index in the example I showed you. Now, it is more difficult to calculate uh, than the Gini index, and it, it does make implementing it more challenging. But honestly, in actuality, most mature software packages such as scikit-learn are going to allow you to use either or because they're both quite common. Now, putting it all together, what we have is greedy selection is kind of the key principle of how the decision tree is created. And what it's going to do is, based on the specifications of things like the depth and the number of nodes of the decision tree, it's going to go through the data and make greedy splits, maximizing uh, the reduction in impurity at each step. So here at the root node, considering all the data, it selected feature number 3 and a threshold of 0.8. And we see uh, for one portion of the data, the Gini index dropped to 0. We have something totally pure for the first class. And the other node, something much less pure. And we can see uh, that the algorithm has selected uh, the second feature and a threshold of 4.95. And it splits again. Now. Maybe we had specified this to only look for a decision tree of, of depth 3, and it will terminate there. If we specified it so it would look further, maybe with these nodes it would try to find another split to further, um, you know, reduce impurity going down. Now that you know a little bit about how a decision tree is trained, um, what are the pros and cons of using this method? Well, first, it's quite simple. Um, this is not a hard concept to understand. It makes intuitive sense to want to divide up data in a way that's going to put more things of a single class uh, together. It is a really sensible way to do business. It's also what's called explainable. So for any path down the decision tree, I know every step the algorithm took to reach that given conclusion. So if we just look back for a minute, if I know something was concluded by the algorithm to be in the third category of flowers, meaning it goes to this 
uh, leaf node, I know that it reached that decision because it measured these two features and they were, uh, they had a certain value with respect to those thresholds. I know exactly what the algorithm went through. And so this is quite useful in practice because if it got it wrong or if it encountered some weird situation, I can get an understanding why. Certain other methods in machine learning don't provide any type of explanation. Perhaps most notably is, is deep learning. This is not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but something to keep in mind as you address different use cases. Decision trees are also well known to be highly performant. They work fast. The training process can be relatively quick, as same with inference. They also can work well with relatively small amounts of data. However, uh, they do uh, suffer in terms of accuracy, especially against state-of-the-art methods, although there's been some advances in decision trees with related approaches such as the random forest model and gradient boosted decision trees that actually go a long way in addressing some of the accuracy concerns. So thank you again for tuning into today's lecture and stay tuned for more content.